Uh, so thank you for bearing with us, everybody. Uh, as we got through a little bit of our technical difficulty there, I'm Riley Black. I'm going to be your host for the next couple of hours, and uh, you'll see me at 5 o'clock. But right now, we have uh, Dr. Kieran McNulty, who's going to talk to us uh, in just a moment. Keep in mind that we're taking questions for donations. So if you go to Dino Nerds for Black Lives at gmail.com, um, you can send us a receipt of the donation that you've made. It uh, doesn't matter what the amount is. Uh, and include that with your question, and I will do my best to keep on top of that and read it as we're going on air. Thank you, Adam, for uh, throwing that in the stream chat as well. So without further ado, I'm going to go on mute for a minute. And uh, Dr. McNulty, it's, it's all yours. Great. Thank you. So I want to talk a little bit about my work on the origin and evolution of apes. And to do that, I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Okay. Hopefully that's coming through. It does. Okay. I see it. And um, I, I want to I want to reiterate what Riley just said about about making donations. And you can tell yourself as I'm going through this talk, and things may seem to, um, seem particularly vague or not well explained. Uh, pretend like I did that on purpose so that you will make some donations and ask some questions. Um, but, but uh, either way, please do, and, and I'm really excited to be here, and I'm, I really want to thank the organizers for, for putting this together. It's a, it's a great cause and something I'm happy to participate in. When we talk about um, our research in paleontology, or really all of the sciences, we often um, go through a, a very long and, and detailed set of analyses and interpretations, and at the end, we, we like to thank our our contributors and our colleagues and our collaborators. And I, I think that's the wrong way to do things. And so I wanna start by thanking um, my collaborators and, and the people uh, without whom I can't do any of this work. And um, as Darwin said, in the long history of humankind and, and animal kind too, those who learn to collaborate and improvise most effectively have prevailed. And whatever the cause, whatever the issue, um, whatever scientific discipline we're interested in, it really is collaboration and working together that's, that's gonna allow us to prevail. So I wanna start by thanking the National Museums of Kenya. All of my um, field work is done in Kenya and it's done with the National Museums as, as a collaborator. Um, they, they, they supply scientists and, and know-how and, um, and curation facilities, et cetera. And it's, again, I can't do this work without them. The people on Rusinga Island where, where I work um, in particular, have made this work not only possible, but, but enjoyable and exciting, and they've really welcomed our team into their community. So uh, a, a big thank you, or Erokamano Madwong, um, to the people of Rusinga, um, many collaborators, and of course, my funding agencies. So uh, again, I want to start with this, because this is how research gets done, through collaboration and uh, teamwork. But when I think of myself, um, obviously we're talking about paleontology today, but I, I am an anthropologist. I'm in an anthropology department at the University of Minnesota. And as an anthropologist, um, I'm broadly interested in questions related to humans. Uh, this is a great graphic um, that Holly Dunsworth was kind enough to let me use many years ago. And it, it gives you kind of a, a perspective on some of the different issues we focus on just in biological anthropology and everything from primate behavior to human anatomy, the evolution of human anatomy, but also DNA uh, and genomics. So these are some of the things as an anthropologist I'm interested in, but I also am very uh, specifically interested in understanding the paleobiology of some of the, the closest relative to humans. And so I am a paleontologist by practice. And when you put these things together, uh, I like to think of myself as a paleoanthropologist, someone who's trying to understand the evolution of humans and humans' closest relatives um, from the fossil record and really build up that paleobiology. So um, again, I want to focus on apes and specifically the origin and early evolution of apes. And to talk about apes in any sense, we really have to start with the question, what is an ape? And um, some of you out there may have great answers to this question. Some of you may have never thought about this question, but um, it's worth thinking about when we talk about the origin of this group. But here's an example of a, a fairly um, interesting ape. Um, 
a member of the Hylobatids. This is a gibbon. And the gibbon's a great example for sort of illustrating what we think of as um, the basic features of apes. Things like having an upright posture. And so apes, unlike some of the other primates, are more upright in, in their behaviors. Things like having a mobile joint, uh, joints in our arms and our legs, we can move these around in big circles. We can put our arms up over our heads in ways that, that we don't think of deers or dogs or, or other animals like that do. Apes have large brains. We're some of the most encephalized primates and primates are some of the most encephalized mammals. Apes also have very long arms. And so you can see in this gibbon, the arms are not quite twice as long as the legs. And this reflects locomotion that is really focused on swinging and climbing in trees um, rather than locomoting with our feet. Apes tend to have short backs. So we, we've shortened up our posture and this, this or our backs and this goes along with having upright posture. And probably the, the classic feature that we use to define apes is, is that we've lost our tails. And so this differentiates us not only with most of the primates, but also with most of the, um, most of the mammals. And particularly, I wanna make this distinction, um, apes are not monkeys. And so um, you can see that monkey there has a nice long, interesting tail. Um, this is something the apes lost very early on. So these are some of the features that characterize the living apes. And the questions that I'm interested in as a paleoanthropologist are which of these features, if any, characterize the earliest apes? How can we identify in the fossil record something that really looks like a monkey, but may have started evolving in the direction of modern apes? So when we think about the living apes on the planet, we've got several different groups, not many actually, there are very few apes left on the planet. The gibbons and siamangs, like the one I just showed you, these are the lesser apes, they're small. And the rest of these belong with the great apes. So humans, chimpanzees and bonobos, gorillas and orangutans. And again, this is just the handful of apes that's still left on this planet. If you went back into the Miocene, the time period that I'm interested in between 23 and 5 million years ago, there would have been 50, 60, 70 different species of apes. All we have left are these, um, these few major clades. And so what I'm interested in then as a paleontologist is taking this tree of living apes and looking way down here at the base. What can we uncover at the base of this tree that may reveal um, the selective pressures that, that led to apes evolving in a different direction from the other primates? So the timing of this, the timing of the earliest apes is actually a really interesting time in earth history called the Paleogene-Neogene transition. And so this is the time when we get to the end of the Oligocene and the early parts of the Miocene. And there are several major events that happen at this time that make it really interesting for studying the evolution of, of animals and plants. And so one of the things that happens that's particularly relevant to the origin of the apes is that Africa, which for, for millions of years has been an isolated island, Africa is gonna join with Eurasia roughly 20 million years ago. And as Africa pushes together with the Eurasian subcontinents, uh, this is gonna impact regional temperatures and it's going to create an exchange of flora and fauna. Animals and plants are gonna be able to migrate out of Africa and animals and plates, plants are gonna migrate into Africa. And so this is really gonna shuffle the ecosystems in a way that's, that hasn't been seen for millions of years in Africa. There's also a global temperature spike that happens here, um, just, just here in the middle Miocene. And so in the early Miocene, when I'm working, when we see the origin of the apes, we're working up to this temperature spike. And so that spike in temperature seems to be associated with a lot of really radical changes um, in the animal community. And we're looking at the time period just before that, trying to see what these earliest apes looked like before this temperature spike that seems to have led to the evolution of a much more modern looking type of ape. And so when you put all of this together, what you end up with 
in the early Miocene is a major shift in mammalian evolution from what we had in the Paleogene toward more modern looking animals. And so we're, we're sort of picking up the last gasp uh, in, some, in some sense of, of these Paleogene animals before this new type of animal starts to take over. So my research is conducted, as I said, in Kenya, and it's primarily based on an island called Rusinga Island. And I like to call Rusinga the Island of the Apes because it is so well known for its fossil apes. Um, fossil preservation there overall is tremendous. I'll, I'll show you a couple photos. Um, but the apes in particular are very well documented. And so here's a picture of Africa. You can see Kenya over here on the eastern side of the continent. And if we focus in on Kenya in particular, um, you can see in this topographic map um, what's often called the Great Rift Valley of Kenya running down the the western third of the country. And this rift valley is actually three different rifts that all meet here in western Kenya. So you've got a northern branch, you've got this southeastern branch, and then you have a much shorter western branch. And we call that the failed rift arm. And that's actually the, the area that I work in, this failed rift arm called the Nyenza Rift. And this is where the most of the Miocene fossils in Kenya are, are located. So I'm going to focus here down at the end of that failed rift arm on an island called Rusinga. So here we, we've done a, a close-up satellite view. You can see the island just off the coast of the mainland in Lake Victoria. And if you look closely, or actually you don't even have to look closely because it's a, a lovely satellite view, um, you can see the remnants of this volcano. And so this was a massive volcano sitting here on the equator that was associated with the rifting. And there's since been a lot of faulting, the accumulation of water to form Lake Victoria, which means that now that Rusinga is an island, but back in the early Miocene, Rusinga was not an island. There was no Lake Victoria. Instead, this was an area that accumulated sediments on the edge of this volcano. And those sediments, because they're associated with the volcano, um, tended to fossilize very well. And this is why Rusinga is such a fantastic place to find fossils. As a side note, um, this isn't really related to my, my scientific work, but it is related to some of my outreach activities. If you look at Rusinga and compare it to the island just next to it called Mafangano, um, there's a radical difference there in the, um, in the vegetation cover. And this is because Rusinga has a lot of people living on it and those people need to purify their water. Um, and you can see it's, it's been very, very devastated, which makes it hard to grow crops and so on and so forth. So um, it's, it's a part of the world that's fantastic for fossil hunting and for scientific research and paleobiology. But it's also a place that requires scientists to come in and do more than just cherry pick fossils and go back and write papers, but to become, become part of the community and become part of the solution for the people who live there. So, as I said, the fossil preservation on Rusinga is, is really outstanding because of this, um, because of the proximity to this volcano called the Kisangiri volcano. And so back in the early Miocene, when the Kisangiri was in its heyday, it would have been erupting frequently uh, in, in a geological sense, and probably erupted over the course of about six million years. And for the first three million years of that, we have um, good fossilized mammals. And so that's the time period I want to focus on about 20 to 17 million years ago. So this picture will give you a sense of what it's like to work on Rusinga. Um, this, is a, this is a snapshot of one of the fossil localities and every piece of white object in that picture is, is fossilized. So you can get a sense there. Some of these fossil localities, you can't even take a step because there's so much fossil material. And this makes it a fantastic place to work, to conduct research. And it means that at a place like Rusinga, we stand a good chance of getting enough information, enough data from a variety of different perspectives that we can really um, do a good job, hopefully, of putting together high resolution paleobiology, paleo environments um, based on all of this information. So we, we conduct research um, similar to most, most paleontological projects. Um, we do very traditional work with, with sieving 
um, and, and excavating in, in squares, uh, very archaeological style excavation. Um, we do very careful work with, with dental picks and, and with, uh, with makeup brushes. In this case, you can see me brushing off a Hyrax jaw. We do a lot of geology. Much of the work that we do is focused on the geology. And in fact, nothing we do makes any sense if we can't put it in a geological context. So here you can see one of the fossil sites and a geologist up there measuring sections. Um, we, we've also done some more high-tech research um, using, using materials like a differential GPS or a total station. Um, we spent a couple of years mapping every bone on the surface of, of four different fossil sites. And so um, and when I say bone, I mean anything that was larger than two centimeters or identifiable. And so we ended up mapping, I believe, about 27,000 bone fragments. And this will allow us to, to conduct taphonomic research and to better understand the context of our fossils. Um, this last picture you can see is, is sort of a, a very, very typical paleontological survey where people are crawling together next to each other trying to look at, at fossil material. You can see down here the right, right side of this picture, uh, sorry, the, the right-hand person in this picture is Samuel Muteti from the National Museums of Kenya who's leading this. Um, he's also getting his PhD at the University of Minnesota uh, focusing on the middle mice. So when we work, started working on, on Rusinga Island, this was 2006, so 14 years ago, uh, we came up with three primary um, research goals, things that we, we wanted to focus all of our research questions on. One of this was basic geochronology, right? Trying to understand how old the fossil deposits on Rusinga are. Um, other fossil sites in the area, how old those are, how do they relate to each other? Can we put them in a sequence? Can we get high enough resolution in our geochronology to actually place these different sites uh, in sequence with each other? That might seem like a trivial exercise given that we are primarily volcanoclastic deposit. Um, however, these carbonatite volcanoes in East Africa tend to lose their potassium very quickly. And so um, potassium argon dating and, and now argon argon dating has been uh, notoriously difficult to do at these sites. So we're, we're about to, to submit a paper on the, on the redating of the sites. So we, we have made a lot of progress, but it's, it's not as, as easy as you might think. A second major research goal is, is trying to understand the paleoecology. So um, again, as an anthropologist, I'm, I'm focused on the apes, but even with that focus, I wanna know what was the rest of the ecology like? What kind of habitats did these apes live in? What was the climate like? What do taphonomic analyses reveal about these early apes? What were they eating? What was eating them? Um, these are the sorts of questions we want to answer. And of course, that's just from an ape perspective. We've got a hundred other mammal species, um, all of which are interesting in their own right. And um, so, you know, sort of unpacking the paleoecology and trying to develop a high resolution um, paleoecological record is, is really exciting. The third set of questions, again, as a as an anthropologist, I was primarily interested in the systematics of the apes. And the apes from Rusenga, despite how well known they are, um, are the subject of pretty intense debate over whether or not they're even apes. Um, there, there's an argument because they're so primitive looking, um, people have suggested that, in fact, they may not be apes at all, they may just be a primitive catarine, and, and catarines are the groups of old world monkeys and apes. So something that um, evolutionarily comes before old world monkeys and apes split from each other. So trying to, trying to add to this debate and, and inform this debate was, was one of my primary goals when we started in 2006. And that's, um, that's where I'm going to focus my talk today. In the end, you put these research goals together and, and this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to fill in this picture. This is, a, this is a mural done by Jay Maternus. It's hanging in the American Museum of Natural History. And this is the level of information we would love to get. We wanna know what these apes are doing, how they're locomoting, what their behaviors are, what kind of groups they live in. Do they live up in trees as, as is shown here, or do they tend to prefer living in the ground? They live in forests or woodlands or open areas. Um, so th this is when you put those goals together, really what, what we're trying to end up with. So before I get into the analyses themselves, just to show you some of the types of fossils we find, 
Um, we find lots of apes and other primates. So this is a, a small, smaller catarine primate called Dendropithecus. Um, but we find a variety of other things. Uh, here's a bat skull. Here's a, a lagomorph, a, a little hare. We have hyraxes, unlike the modern hyrax, our hyrax down here in the lower left-hand corner um, is about the size of a donkey. Um, we have things like this anthracothere. If you don't know the anthracotheres, um, you can think of them a little bit like uh, hippo pigs. Um, we have things like calicotheres. Calicotheres are, are fascinating animals, and I like to think of them as as kind of horse rhino bear apes. Um, they're they're perissodactyls, so they're related to horses and and rhinos, but um, this particular calicothere uh, knuckle walks like an ape and it has claws like a bear. It's, it's, it's an insane animal um, and, and spectacular when you find them. We've got little carnivores, we've got big carnivores, um, actually uh, hy hyenodontids in this case, but we also have other things, not just sort of the, the typical mammal teeth. We've got things um, like this lizard, this a little lizard over here in, on the right, just next to that is, is grasshoppers. Um, over here on the left, we have a, a little beehive. So the preservation here is so spectacular. We can find not just sort of the iconic animals that we associate paleontological sites, but a really good cross section of the, of the paleo environment. There's some, some artist reconstructions. Um, here you, you have the calicothere, knuckle walking. As I said, we have various elephants. There's our anthracothere. Um, lots and lots of this thing called Dorcotherium, um, which is related to the modern water chevrotain. It's a tragulid. And of course, the apes. So here are some of the, some of the better ape fossils that have been found. This one in the, the top center is the Mary Leakey skull. Mary, Mary found this in 1948. Um, over on the right-hand side is a partial skeleton of the ape Kembo, and this particular skeleton was found in a hollowed tree trunk. It had been carried there by a, some sort of predator that had eaten most of it and left a few bits for us to find. And you can see some of the, some of the fossil remains are really quite well preserved. Over on the left, you have um, a set of feet preserved in anatomical position. And this particular pair of feet was actually associated with nine other skeletons, you can, partial skeletons, you can see here on the right. So a really good um, set of ape fossils. In fact, it's the only ape prior to the origin of hominins where we have, as far as we can tell, every element in the skeleton represented in the fossil record. So we have found every bit of, of the bony skeleton um, with the exceptions of, you know, some of them are only partial bits, but uh, it, it's really spectacular the, the sort of inform the amounts of information we can get from Rusing. And it allows us to, to get paleo artists to, to do these sorts of reconstructions. So this is a reconstruction of Akembo um, based on a fossil site where we actually found 36 trees that were preserved and we were able to measure the density of the trees on the landscape and the size of the trunks and estimate the, the kind of um, canopy cover and um, give all of that in, in the anatomical information to the paleo artist and, and, and he was able to produce this spectacular picture of Akembo. And of course we find um, not just animals but also um, lots, of, lots of plant fossils. So here you can see leaves and fruits and nuts, um, giant legume of some sort. So it's, again, it's, it's a great place to, to really try to understand the environmental context of early ape evolution. So that's, that's my introduction to Rusinga Island. I, I hope you have found that as exciting as, as I do. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm devastated, in fact, that I won't be able to go there this summer and, and work, but, but hoping, that, um, hoping that global travel opens back up soon. What I want to focus the rest of my talk on is, is an analysis of, of one of the one of the new specimens we found um, pretty recently, and this shot slide is going to show three three of the better specimens we found. Two are pallets, so this one on the left, um, I, I, I say we found. I didn't actually find this one, nor did my team. It was found found before we started work there, but it's it's yet unpublished. Um, this pallet on the right we found in 2017. And the one I want to focus on is actually this very well-preserved fossil ape face, the facial skeleton 
of this ape called Ikembo. And as I said, Ikembo, um, you know, sort of figures prominently in this argument over what do the earliest apes look like. And it Um, it was highly sexually dimorphic, and so we have we, we have very very large specimens, very small specimens that belong in the same species, um, and we we know much about its skeleton, but yet we still have have these debates, and um, there are lots of reasons for that, as as most of you probably know. But one of the reasons is that much of the material from Rusenga Island um, actually gets very warped during during preservation, and so. The sorts of more sophisticated quantitative analyses that, that people are doing these days haven't been possible on some of these specimens because um, they're, they're too worked to, to do sort of sophisticated measurements on. And this discovery in 2016 of the RU70019 is the first time we actually have a well-preserved uh, face that we can do those sorts of analyses on. So I want to walk you through then a series of quantitative analyses on this center specimen. And just to hopefully show you what, what we're working on, this is the same specimen, but um, with a lot of um, sophisticated computer software trying to recreate it and, and mirror image it and mirror parts of it and fit other pieces back on and sew it all together so that we can get as much of the preserved anatomy as possible. So here you can see the specimen as it's preserved in its greatest extent. So we have most of the face there, um, which is really quite nice. Okay, so again, to, to sort of understand the, the context of the questions I wanna talk about, you need to think about the, um, the phylogeny of the apes. And so here's a, here's a figure um, that shows all of the living apes that I've already discussed, and then the outgroup, the old world monkeys here on the left. This is the this is the clade of catarine primates. Old world monkeys plus apes are the catarines. And Ikembo down here, um, I, I need to update this because we, we, we now would put it back to about 20 million years ago. Um, but Ikembo sits right here somewhere near the base of this clade. And where the debate is, is whether it, it's actually down here before apes split off or somewhere in here after apes split off. And so that, that leads me to two sort of fundamental research questions that I wanted to explore with this new fossil. One is what does the ancestral catarine actually look like? Part of trying to answer the question of where the Ikembo might sit means in one way or the other using cladistic analyses, using other sorts of analyses, we have to be able to figure out what this stem node would have looked like. And so what can we say about that based on this new specimen or analyses associated with it? And then two, what then does the new specimen tell us, if anything, of genetic position of Ikembo? Is it truly an ape or is it not? So starting with that first question about the ancestral catarine morphotype, and there are two two contrasting models of what that ancestral catarine might have looked like. The earliest of these models um, suggested by people like Schultz, for example, in the, in the 30s and 40s, um, we can call the neontological model. It's based only on the living primates. And what Schultz and others later observed was that you have both in the old world monkeys and, uh, and in the apes, uh, a very similar morphology among some of the, the species that are thought or were thought to have been the most primitive. And so here you're looking at a, a, a colobine monkey and a gibbon, and they share a number of features. And people who support the neontological model argued that, well, if you have these same features on both uh, branches of, of the phylogeny, then that probably is the ancestral uh, character state or represents the ancestral character states. Now, remember, this was primarily before cladistic analyses. So um, this was this was based much more on a, on a sort of gross sampling of the evidence. But let's contrast that with a paleontological model. 
people, particularly in the last 30 years, as more and more fossils have, have been found, and those fossils have been placed on this Caterine family tree, have noted that close to that ancestral Caterine, there are a lot of fossils that share features with each other and look nothing like the modern Gibbons or Colobons. And so the paleontological model, when you add these fossils in, actually might better support um, a, a common ancestor that looks nothing like Colobines or Gibbons, but looks much more like this very primitive Caterine, Egyptopithecus, or uh, the, the more advanced, but, but still basal Caterine, Sidonius. And so these are two contrasting models that I wanted to see if we could test um, using morphometric analyses. So um, just a, a, a very quick intro to, to geometric morphometrics. Um, this is a type of quantitative analysis that's based um, typically on landmarks and semi-landmarks. And we can contrast that with more traditional morphometric methods. More traditional methods are gonna be based on things like lengths and angles. And lengths and angles are, are perfectly fine for some sorts of analyses. If the anatomy you need to characterize can be easily characterized by lengths and angles, then you should do so. The problem with this is ultimately what we end up with is abstract data that loses its context. And so once you take those angles and, and lengths uh, and, and analyze them, what you have are, in this case, three different measurements that have lost their geometric relationships to each other. When you put those in an analysis, a multivariate analysis, each one of these and the variation of those measurements can get bigger or smaller, but they can't change in relation to each other. And that's where a geometric morphometric approach gives you a different set of information. And so in this case, geometric morphometrics is gonna be based on anatomical landmarks. And you can see on this skull, I put in lots of landmarks defining various anatomical positions. And we're going to analyze those landmarks in terms of their Cartesian coordinates. And so in this case, I've just got X and Y, but of course we live in a 3D universe, so we're gonna do X, Y, and Z. And notice when we abstract the data from the skull itself, the data still conserve or preserve their geometric relationships. In other words, this X1 has a specific relationship to this X2 and to this X3. Same with the Ys, same with the Zs. And so we're preserving much more of the geometric information, much more of the shape information when we do this sort of approach. Let me warn you that that doesn't mean you're going to get easier answers. It almost always means the opposite. You're getting more information, you're getting more noise. And so it, it, doing this sort of analysis almost always means that questions get much more interesting. Let's use that word but it also means that you have more sources of information. And if you know how to parse out that information, you have the potential for an answering much more complex questions. So it's a, it's a really exciting way to pursue quantitative analysis. Now I've represented it here as very simple landmarks. Um, here's another example from, from some of the work of one of my former graduate students that shows you a more complex um, landmark based modeling. And so it's not just a few landmarks on a skull, but we're, we're doing a lot more complicated work. Right. So to get to our fossil here, here again is the Akembo skull shown rotating mostly because I just discovered I could do that. And this first question about the ancestral Caterine morphotype I wanted to explore using um, phylogenetic comparative methods. In other words, if I look at not just the apes, but if I look at lots of different primates that are closely related to apes, in this case, the apes are hominoidea, circopithecoidea, these are the old world monkeys we talked about together, those are the caterines, and I also threw in a few new world, and together the three of these are the anthropoids. And so if we, take a geometric morphometric approach to quantifying uh, the, the anatomy in all of these groups and species of all of these groups, can we use that to reconstruct what some of these ancestral nodes might have looked like? And so in this case, um, you can see, I, I did not have a good sample of new world monkeys, only 11% of the species. 
We have a very good sample of hominoidea. 58% doesn't look good, but that's primarily because there are a lot of gibbon species. Um, their faces don't differ all that much. So um, what we're missing here And then Circumpithecoidea, these, these are the most speciose of the catarine clades, and um, we have about 33% of that clade represented. It seems like we lost Dr. Uh, Melty from it. Let me see if we can get him back on. No idea what just happened. But certainly, I, I want to hear the end of that talk. So hopefully, we'll be able to get him back in short order here. Let me just let me go dark for just a minute so you're just not staring at Oh, here we go. Sorry about that. Sorry that dropped out. Can I jump back in? Yes, certainly can. All right. So, um, I, and I believe the internet went out on my end. So, apologize for everyone who's watching. Um, we, we have a storm going through here. Uh, what, did you want to share wanted... your screen again for slides, or do you just want to talk? Oh, no, no, I definitely want to share my screen. Sorry about okay. that. Where are we? There. So um, I believe when I dropped, I was talking about this comparative data set. And again, the goal here is to use data from all of these different catarines and a, and a couple new world monkeys to see if we can reconstruct what these ancestral states would have looked like. Yes, I'm going to focus specifically on just a few of them. You can see there's lots of ancestral nodes there. Um, I'm just going to focus on these that are a, primary interest, so the, the ancestral catarine and then the ancestral ape. All right, so this is the sort of scientific slide you should never show. Um, it is a mess, but this is what we call phylomorphospace. space. And so this is essentially a principal component analysis, or you can think of it uh, as a multivariate summary of a lot of, a lot of data in a high dimensional space projected into just two dimensions. And what makes it interesting um, compared to a, a regular principal component analysis is it also includes all of those ancestral nodes. And so we're not just looking at how our modern taxa distribute in their ana uh, anatomy, but we're also including in here how these different ancestors would have looked. And so just to walk you through this, this mess, and, and sorry, one thing I should mention is where you see very long branches connecting things, that suggests that there was a great deal of anatomical change between, um, between those two things. In other words, things that are very closely related are going to be connected by lines. But if they're far apart in this space, that suggests that even though they're closely related, there's been a great deal of, of anatomical change. So that's, that's one way to, to think about reading this, this plot. So just to show you some of the groups, um, I, I put the labels on here that, that may or may not help, but let me, let me summarize them more broadly. These are the circopithecines, uh, so, sorry, circopithecines. So this is one major group of old world monkeys. And you can see our old world monkeys, not only are there many species, but they're actually anatomically quite diverse. And when you think about, we're talking about humans and gorillas, right? Those are really different looking animals. The old world monkeys are actually much more different. They're much more variable. And so they, they occupy a much greater part of this space because the difference between some of these monkeys is, is tremendous. Uh, the colobines are, are circled here in the orange. They're, they're a, a much uh, less variable group, at least in their facial anatomy. Here we have the, the gibbons and siamangs. And I, I told you, you, you may not have believed me, there's not a lot of variation in their faces. Look at how tightly they cluster. Right? There's, there's, there's very little going on here. And so we've only sampled 
about the same information as far as this research question. Then here are the great apes. And so humans, chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, and quite a diverse group. Again, when you put humans in, in any mammal group, they're, they're always gonna come out a little weird. Um, but, but again, not as, not as diverse as, as the circumpenthesine monkeys. So this is how these different anatomies distribute in, in a shape space. And it also shows you how their reconstructed ancestors distribute. And so in particular, here you have the ancestral catarine. And so if you look carefully, our ancestral catarine, this star is located really right in the middle of the colobines and the gibbons. This is exactly what was predicted by the neontological model of the ancestral cataract. If we move up to the ancestral hominoid, so this is the ancestral uh, crown ape, that's actually very similar. And so this model would predict that the ancestral crown ape looks very similar to the ancestral cataract. And if we then go to the ancestral great ape, that's actually very similar as well. And so it suggests that uh, by this model, that all of this diversity that we see in the living apes is actually much more recent, that it happened much more recently. So just to put some, maybe some more familiar names on, on these, if we look at the closest living taxon to our ancestral catarine, it's a red colobus monkey. The shape that is most similar to, to our ancestral catarine is the red colobus. The shape that's closest to the ancestral ape, and this surprised me quite a bit, it's not the gibbon, um, it's actually the chimpanzee. The chimpanzee face in this model is predicted to be um, most similar to the ancestral ape. As I said, my, my, one of my main questions was what does the ancestral catarine look like? This is a reconstruction of that ancestral catarine, and it's based because the red colobus was most similar um, what I did was I started with a red colobus skull and I thin plate spline warped it to that ancestral condition based on the landmark configurations. In other words, it starts with the red colobus, it moves those landmarks into what the ancestral cataract should have been, and then it grabs the surface and does the same thing. And so you get this surface reconstruction showing you what the ancestral cataract might have looked like. Well, what does that what, what can we say about akembo based on this? Ultimately, my goal is to understand this early ape akembo. And what I did in this case, th there were a couple of ways we could have done this. One was we could have used some sort of method to estimate the phylogenetic position and the branch length of akembo on this phylogeny. Um, that would be the righteous way to do this. And if I thought we would get a good answer, in other words, a, a reasonable or repeatable answer, um, I would have done that, but for a variety of reasons, I don't think we can get a good branch length estimate for Akembo. And so what I did instead was I created that phylomorpho space and I used the rotation of that space. In other words, how it gets projected into those two dimensions. I use that to project Akembo into that space. And then I calculated the, the full rank distance. So not just in that summary, but in the entire shape space. How close is Akembo? to some of these different ancestral nodes. So it's the same mucked up plot that you saw before, um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna project Ikembo in, in here so you can see where it goes. And Ikembo actually positions itself well within not just the apes, but disturbingly the great apes. Only, to my recollection, only one person has argued that Ikembo might be a great ape um, in, in the last 30 years. And, and even he only argued it for, for a few years before he, he clawed back and decided, no, that's not the case. Well, Akembo actually <laughs> plots out within the great apes, not just the apes. So that was interesting. But something to consider here is that all I've done is project this into a two-dimensional space. It, it exists in the larger shape space, and we need to think about not just those two dimensions, but all the dimensions and, and how it relates to these different ancestral states. And so if we consider the entire shape space, we do find that Akembo is most similar to the great ape, but not much more similar than it is to the ancestral ape. In other words, if we think about it this way, our Akembo fossil sits here in shape space, 
and it's closest to the ancestral great ape, but it's kind of similarly close to the ancestral ape. So I don't want to read too much into this saying, oh, it's actually a great ape, but it does suggest that this probably is an ape and it's situated well within the ape morphology. So what are the implications of our, our analysis? Well, phylogenetic affinities of Akembo um, have typically placed it within the hominoidea. If we take this phylomorphometric approach, we get a similar answer. We also find support for this traditional or neontological model of the ancestral catarine being similar to colobus or the colobines and the gibbons. And in my model, I found no support for the ancestral catarine looking like Egyptopithecus or Afropithecus. So the ancestral ape may not have resembled hylobatids in its facial morphology. So let me talk for a minute about why you should not believe anything I've just told you. And I've given some, some fancy graphs. I could have put up, put up even more p-values and, and f-values and lots of statistics. Um, but ultimately, my analysis is only as good as the data I have. And the data I used were entirely based on extant taxa. That's what Caterine should have looked like. We're also only based on extant taxa. It's maybe not surprising I came up with the same result. If you actually test the phylogenetic signal in the facial morphology of the Caterines, it is significant but weak. And so it suggests that there is phylogenetic si signal in the facial skeleton, but it's, there's not that much. In other words, we might be picking up other things besides phylogeny. Ultimately, I wanna go back to something I said early in this talk. We have five clades of living apes on the planet, and those are trying to represent 60 or 70 or 80 different species that lived in the Miocene. That's a pathetic sample. We can't necessarily assume that these five species or these five clades that are left really can represent the kind of diversity we need to get at this question of the ancestral pattern. So how do you deal with that? Well, again, there are several approaches you could come up with, but the one I thought was most relevant to this analysis, I can't invent new ape species where I can measure all of their anatomy, which I could, but I have a huge sample of old world monkeys and I can measure the heck out of those. And what happens then if we take our old world monkeys and we sample them down to just the number of apes that we have? How does that ancestral anatomy change if we have only a small sample of monkeys? Hey, then we can take another sample of the same size, a different random sample. Where does our ancestor go then? We can keep doing this a thousand times and we can see how much variability do we expect in our ancestral reconstructions if we have a really bad sample of old world monkeys, which we don't, but we do have the ape. So this is a way of simulating perhaps how bad are these ancestral reconstructions? So um, what you're looking at here is the same phylomorpho space. I took all the lines out so it wasn't as uh, distracting. These are those three ancestral states. And these ellipses represent 95% of these simulated ancestors if we only use a small sample of the old world monkeys. In other words, how does that small sample impact our ancestral states? And surprisingly, it, it barely does. It hardly affects our results at all. Um, this, I was sure this was gonna go the other way and I, I was ready to get up in my soapbox about it. And it turns out, based on a simulation of old world monkeys, our small sample might be sufficient to give us a reasonable estimate of the ancestral state. And we will be publishing them, so look for that. Um, but mostly what I want to conclude with is analyses of these new fossils where we use more advanced phylogenetic comparative methods because we now have decent fossils to do that. They do suggest that Ikembo is truly an ape 
it nests within the hominoidea. And again, this is supported by, by cladistic analyses as well. And so I think we're getting finally to the point where we have consensus that Akembo is truly an ape. I will conclude there. Happy to, to stay on for a bit and, and ask questions, but I'll leave you with a, a shot of my field site on Rusinga Island, which is, as I said, it's a, it's a wonderful place and I encourage you all to visit. Well, thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. I, the way I got back into paleo was through taking paleoanthropology courses at Rutgers. So this like takes me back like, ah, oh, I want to go back to all those things. That, that was awesome. Um, it just for anybody watching, if you want to ask a question, uh, the donation link was just dropped in the chat. So if you look at our about, you have the list of organizations that donations um, should go to for this. Uh, when you get a receipt for that, send that to dino nerds for black lives at gmail.com. If I see it, I will get that question in. But in the meantime, um, you know, I'll ask questions for the next couple of minutes if my cat doesn't drown me out because it's dinner time. Um, Dr. McNulty, did you ever read the book, The Relic or see the movie? Because there's something that you said during the presentation that reminded me a little bit of something from, from that story. No, is the short answer. Okay, okay. It, in that book, it's a sci-fi story, but they come up with this DNA extrapolation program. If you have two points, you can kind of figure out what the common ancestor maybe would have looked like, and the computer spits this out. And this is all like 1995 Michael Crichton-esque kind of stuff. But I just thought it was so fascinating when you're showing that polymorphous space that based upon, you know, the fossil record and, you know, largely our, our extant record, um, still being able to come up with a hypothesis about what some of these, um, you know, last common ancestors or ancestral states might have looked like and kind of creating that search image. That's pretty exciting. Um, how did that idea um, come to like, how did that, the idea to take that approach uh, come to you? So I, I, you know, I certainly did not invent that approach. Um, it's been around for you know, I, I, I'm going to say a few years and it's going to end up being about 10 years, but um, it's it's something that we have not, I think, done a great job in, in the anthropology world of, of really taking advantage of these methods in, in evolutionary biology and, and in paleontology. And, you know, geometric morphometrics really grew up in anthropology for, for reasons that are interesting in, in, in a historical sense. Um, but I, I feel like once you know, once they they sort of became more broadly, more uh, more broadly used, um, other sciences, other disciplines have really done a better job of, of sort of going with it and, and running with it. And so, um, this is this is something that that I've been I've been excited to try for a long time, just waiting for the right fossil. And um, you know that Mary Leakey skull is so is so complete. And I would love, I would love to try this on that. I am, I am skeptical of, of various methods for for unwarping it. It's 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 badly warped. It looks like somebody sat on it. Um, and so I, I've never, I've never wanted to do that because I, I just ultimately, I'm skeptical that the results would be would be robust. And so, the exciting thing, I mean, there are a lot of exciting things about the discovery of that particular skull that we analyzed. But one of them was that it didn't warp, it broke, right? As it was being fossilized, instead of, you know, warping into different positions, the pieces just broke and we could put them back together and, and get the original anatomy. Fascinating. And, and you mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, I'm kind of going back a little bit, um, you know, we're all missing field work right now. I know I certainly am. What is field work, like what's a typical field day on Zynga Island like? Like what does the field work like there? Like I mostly work in, Mesozoic or paleontology, I'm used, you know, four corners area stuff. But I think to a lot of folks, like they're not familiar with like what field work looks like in other places. So we, you know, we, we stay in tents. Um, I, I'm not going to pretend like it's, you know, it, it's really rugged, difficult. It's as far as field work goes, it, it's actually pretty, pretty nice. Um, we are on Lake Victoria. Um, we can't swim in Lake Victoria even. So it's, 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 really quite spectacular in, in that sense. But a typical day, um, you know, we, we usually get breakfast out as soon as the sun comes up and, you know, try to get out of camp by 7.30 or 8 o'clock. Um, when we're on Rasinga, at least, all of the sites are, are on the island. Several of them we can walk to, and in which case, you know, we usually will send a car with some equipment, but, but everyone kind of hikes up to the site. 
Others, you know, depending on where we're working, we, we do have to drive around the island. And then, you know, we, we will bring lunch with us and we usually take about an hour in the afternoon, um, take a break and we, you know, nobody eats for an hour, but everybody needs a little time to relax. And, you know, it does get warm. It's usually mid nineties. Um, there's a, there's a beautiful breeze almost all the time. So it, it's bearable, but about two, two thirty, the breeze will die down for an hour and it's just difficult. Um, we try to wrap up around three thirty or four o'clock because, um, you know, you got to get back to camp, catalog everything. There's always, always lots to do when you get back to camp. And, you know, if you wait, wait until six o'clock, then you get back to camp and everyone's too tired and needs to shower and, and all that. So we try to start early, end early, and then and do work in camp for the rest of the day. Yeah, that sounds like field work to me. Sounds good. Uh, well, we're just about at the end of our time. We're about to jump to our next speaker in just a minute. Uh, I want to announce that we, as you might have seen in the chat, um, that donations have broke $3,500. So that's great. We're going to try and keep that rolling. Was there anything else that you wanted to? Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's spectacular. All right. I want to keep pushing it higher. Um, was there any last points or final things you'd like to say before we close out this afternoon? No, just thank you again. And um, it, it's, it's been a pleasure to do. And I, I was excited to get invited to do it. Well, thank you so much. That was a fascinating talk. I can't wait to read more about it. Sorry, I didn't get the last bit, but. Oh, sorry, yeah, I, th I think uh, Zoom was being cranky with me. I said, just thank you so much for sharing all that. I can't read to, uh, I can't wait to read more about it. And uh, yeah, those images that you showed of, uh, you know, the, the scanned skulls and everything, it's absolutely wonderful. It's great. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, happy to do it. Okay, take care. Bye.